Welcome to our In Focus discussion tonight on racism as a public health crisis. On Tuesday, Salt Lake City adopted a joint resolution to make this declaration. Earlier this year in January, University of Utah Health joined 19 other healthcare systems to make a similar statement, and the CDC also recognizes it as such. So what led up to this? What does it mean for communities of color? And what are the solutions being proposed to dismantle these discriminatory systems? Joining our conversation tonight is Nicole Salazar Hall, a core commissioner for the Salt Lake City Racial Equity and Policing Commission, as well as a commissioner for the Salt Lake City Human Rights Commission. We also have a live via Zoom, Dr. Lynn Camillo, who is the Assistant Dean of Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for the University of Utah Utah School of Medicine. Thank you both for being here tonight. The first question is for both of you, but I will direct it to Nicole first. Nicole, how would you define what a public health crisis is? A public health crisis is anything, any complex health system that affects a geographic, an insular geographic uh, area or group of people. In this case, it is uh, people of color who are being affected by racism. And Dr. Camille, what about you? How would you explain what a public health crisis is to somebody else? Yes, and I think it's important to start by defining what is a public health. You know, public health is the well-being of our communities, our public system, is the well-being of the public in general. So we think of public health as a science that is designed to protect and improving the health of the people living in that communities and the systems that go along with it. And we truly achieve that by promoting healthy lifestyles and uh, working at detecting and preventing and responding to disease. So when you talk about a crisis, you think about, as Nicole mentioned, a very complex or difficult situation that affect the life of those communities and individuals living in that community and leading to a negative adverse impact on the health uh, of that population. And yes. Thank you both for those answers. And Dr. Camille, stay with us here. This next question I will direct to you first. Now let's get into what it means for racism to be declared as a public health crisis. What are some of the harmful impacts that racism has on the mental and physical health for our communities of color? So I think uh, racism has a public health crisis. Um, we have seen for many, many years and even decades that uh, racism has affected underrepresented minorities, the blacks and Latino and other represented group and from a, st a standpoint of mental health and physical health. And probably most importantly, uh, mental health has a lot of times uh, manifestations of uh, mental health would be in the form of physical health. So we saw, for example, as a terms of mental health influences or negative impact of those uh, system, current system in place, those inequities in place. We saw um, mental health affecting those population in the sense that it sort of create a differential access to desirable resources. And uh, along with that poor living condition that can in the long run adversely impact the mental health of those population. And added to that, um, our society behaviors towards uh, accepting a negative cultural perception that tends to perpetuate uh, those uh, beliefs and impacting the self-evaluations of those particular individuals coming from those underrepresented uh, uh, communities and as a result, you know, influencing in a negative way uh, someone's psychological well-being. And uh, when you talk about mental health also, we, we can't help but mention access, right? Uh, when we look at those marginalized population, uh, we think of them as an overrepresented group in not having access to healthcare and uh, healthcare and in that in mental health. And this is largely driven by the lack of uh, being able to afford insurance or even being able to pay for uh, healthcare costs. And there's also the concept of inability to treat race-based trauma that we see because uh, our current system, healthcare system in place is not equipped to really meet the needs and demands of that population. And uh, as a result, uh, we don't treat them adequately or we don't fulfill their needs or what may be viewed as a minimum standard of care. 
And uh, one thing I wanted to address in regards to uh, how that can affect mental health is this concept of skepticism, where because of um, the perception that from disadvantaged populations towards our healthcare system, this uh, mistrust per perceptions that have led to perhaps view the healthcare system uh, uh, more importantly from a historical perspective to not looking after themselves and pro pro protecting those marginalized groups because of intentionally, uh, historically, and systematically uh, harming uh, those populations, uh, especially the Blacks. Thank you for that. Nicole, let's hear from you. Anything you would like to add on to that? I think Dr. Kimmy, you hit it right on the head. And the practical upshot of that is that we have people of color who are in need of mental health care, who are in need of physical health care and aren't reaching it, aren't able, able to get it. 25% of the, the calls from black people that went to the Salt Lake City Police Department were calls for mental health. That is a significant problem that does need to be addressed, not only on the policing level, but also on, on the state level of how do we get people of color, particularly black people, mental health care. And in terms of physical health, we've seen this with the COVID pandemic where 14% of our population here in Utah is only 14%, but we represented 40% of the COVID cases. That is a significant problem and it is, it is an endemic issue and it is, it's risen to the level of a crisis. And this discussion is just getting started. Nicole and Dr. Camille, you hold that thought. We have to take a quick commercial break, but when we return, we'll resume our in-focus discussion on racism as a public health crisis. Thanks for staying with us for our second In Focus discussion tonight on racism as a public health crisis. Before the break, we were joined by Nicole Salazar Hall of the Salt Lake City Racial Equity and Policing Commission and Dr. Lynn Camillo of the University of Utah School of Medicine. We pick up now right where we left off. We'll start with you this time, Dr. Camillo. Back in January, nearly two dozen healthcare systems, including the University of Utah Health, release a joint statement declaring racism as a public health crisis. Could you talk about what led up to that decision? Uh, yes, I think as we have seen a movement across the nation over the past nearly two years, and uh, the University of Utah saw racism as a public health crisis, as a threat to providing care to our patient families and communities. And we wanted to address racism in our workforce in multiple areas with the most important being uh, patient care. So as a result of that, I think we've known that uh, there have been health disparities existing in the United States for many, many generations and many, many decades. But uh, addressing systemic medicine, systemic racism in medicine had not been attempted until now. And um, the University of Utah declared as a uh, racism as a public health crisis to really bring the best together, uh, uh, including those across the nation, in finding solutions to resolve this, this to to resolve this public health crisis, and also realizing that these health disparities, uh, we need to look at those in terms of racism being the major cause, and uh, finding anti-racism uh, uh, initiatives as part of the solution. Nicole, same question to you. On Tuesday, the Salt Lake City Council and Mayor Aaron Mendenhall adopted a joint resolution to make the declaration, and this came after it was reviewed and approved by both the Salt Lake City Human Rights Commission and the Racial Equity and Policing Commission. Could you talk about what led up to that decision? Yes, Representative Sandra Hollins had presented the same resolution or a very similar resolution to the state legislature. It did not pass, unfortunately, though we did uh, support it as a resolution. Uh, Kevin Nguyen with the Utah Department of Health approached, uh, the mayor approached both uh, the uh, Salt Lake City Human Rights Commission and the Salt Lake City Racial Equity and Policing Commission to support a similar resolution. And of course, we, we absolutely supported it. We reviewed the language prior to its issuance to the mayor and full-heartedly supported the, this, this declaration that racism is a public health crisis. And Nicole, stay with us here. This next question is for both of you, but I will direct it to Nicole first. What are the consequences or long-term outcomes of these structural inequities? The long-term consequences of that are that we will continue to have a generational wealth gap. We'll continue to have people of color 
unable to access basic necessities such as health care, unable to access the same educational opportunities as other uh, white children and white people, that in and of itself is going to be an economic burden to all of us. It only benefits everybody if children of color have equal opportunities. Some of those, uh, we've seen some of the, those inequities in the form of numbers. As it stands, 61% of the children of, of children cited in the Salt Lake City School District last year were children of color. Uh, approximately 45% of the children removed from their families in the state of Utah were children of color. We're seeing some very, very stark contrasts in the way children of color are treated versus the way white children are treated. And that in, a, in and of itself will create um, an adverse childhood ex uh, reaction or um, adverse childhood experience, which then, if there are enough of them built up together and they don't have enough access to health care, mental health services, they will experience uh, a shorter life expectancy, uh, greater incidences of uh, physical health ailments such as heart disease, stroke. This is not a sustainable situation for anybody in this society, white or, or people of color. Thank you for sharing that data. Dr. Camillo, we have about a minute left. Would you like to add anything as far as the consequences and long-term impacts of racism as a public health crisis? Yes, as Nicole pointed out, and I wanted to add to that, as it applies to the medical communities, we will continue, unless we take action to resolve this public health crisis, we will continue to see the persistence of chronic health disparities. If you look at data comparing blacks, uh, comparing blacks uh, populations to whites when it comes to um, cardiovascular outcome or stroke or breast cancer, um, the black population is at much higher risk of, of, of having those diseases. And uh, when you talk about pre-existing condition, blacks are much higher risk of having high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke, and dying at an early age for related complications. And uh, speaking about uh, black women uh, of age during age, when you look at pregnancies, uh, these women, black women are four times, four times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes because of those racial inequities and uh, racism being a public health crisis. These statistics and data that both of you are sharing are just so staggering, alarming and sobering. Nicole and Dr. Camillo, hold that thought. We do have to take another quick commercial break, but when we return, we'll resume our in-focus discussion on racism as a public health crisis. Welcome to our third and final In Focus discussion tonight on racism as a public health crisis. We pick up our discussion now with Nicole Salazar Hall of the Salt Lake City Racial Equity and Policing Commission and Dr. Lynn Camillo of the University of Utah School of Medicine. Dr. Camillo, this question is for you first. What are some ways that the COVID-19 pandemic illustrated how these pre-existing structural inequities created heavier burdens on communities of color in Utah. Yes, if you look at the demographic composition of the Utah population, we have about 14% of Hispanics, 3% uh, Asians, and uh, the rest uh, of underrepresented group, including African-American. Uh, African-American represent about less than 2% of the Utah population. So when you look at Blacks and Latin Americans who get infected, those groups are more likely to have pre-existing conditions that increase the risk of presenting with a more severe disease when it comes to infection with the COVID-19. And also uh, that particular group, uh, underrepresented group, tend to have a higher mortality risk and um, because often they present them when they're very sicker and they don't get um, adequate treatment. And why do they present in a perhaps much, much sicker shape? Because they can't take time off work. They put off their symptoms. If they take time off work, that means no pay, no sick leave, and they can't afford to do that. They don't have a choice. So therefore, and a lot of times, uh, those groups are the sole breadwinner for their families. So taking time work off work and knowing that they leave paycheck from paycheck 
from paycheck to paycheck means you don't have an income coming in and you have a family uh, who relies on you. So those population tends to have a higher mortality risk and present sicker and uh, as dramatic as this may sound, they tend to re even receive uh, less uh, treatment when it comes to uh, 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 treatment of the COVID-19 infection. Nicole, would you like to add to this? Yes, what we have seen as well, in addition to those, those numbers, is that the, the people who are more adversely affected by this tend to be some of our frontline workers in food service, in restaurants, industrial jobs. You can't work from home. Uh, you, you can't do uh, a food service job service or cooking when you're at home. And so they tended to be the, the people who were on the front lines having to go to work. And if they were not, they were laid off and having to find another job another job that put them at greater risk of contracting COVID-19. Really, people who had no other choices, work or be safe, right? And then you have to find the very fine line in between that. Dr. Kamiyu, what are some of the ways University of Utah Health is taking steps to overcome the healthcare disparities in our communities? Yes, I think the University of Utah, I think we realize that there's still much needed work uh, needing to be done. And um, we took, the University of Utah took the, step, the first step as acknowledging that racism is a public health crisis that impacts the lives of our community. And uh, over the past year or so, we've seen at the University of Utah uh, growth and expansion of health equity offices. And with that, we have collectively come together uh, across all departments to come up with solutions and uh, resources to build pipeline programs designed to create opportunities and level the fields uh, for those underrepresented uh, minority groups. And I think one action also is by collectively coming together to the those to the expansion of those health equity offices at the university is it had allowed us to revisit our policies and uh, in an equity lens and also to change to implement policy changes that promote uh, equity uh, opportunity and inclusion and also most importantly uh, learning learning from our community members um, learning from our patients learning from the the the, the, the individuals living in those community allowing them to those experience so we can be aware of what they've gone to and also um, be able to be comfortable starting difficult and tough conversations so we can uh, fight against uh, racism as a public health crisis. Thank you. And to you, Nicole, what are some ways that Salt Lake City is working towards dismantling racist systems and repairing our communities? The city is doing quite a bit, actually. Uh, prior to even this declaration, this resolution, Mayor Mendenhall uh, rolled out in a citywide equity plan, evaluating each and every one of the city's policies, ordinances, to determine whether there was um, whether it was either biased or had maybe an inadvertent effect on people of color or even women. Uh, the mayor has uh, created a chief equ chief equity officer and uh, placed Coletta Lynch in that position. And her whole focus is to is to focus on equity in the city, both within the city's inner workings and also uh, for the people of Salt Lake City. Uh, a new equity manager is going to be hired here in the near future to work directly with the Human Rights Commission and the Salt Lake City Racial Equity and Policing Commission. And a new hire, a new full-time employee will be put in place to address the school to prison pipeline. So she is doing quite a bit in the city to address racism in general. Right, it's a tall task, but we're just glad that there are being steps that are being taken and the work is starting now. You've been hearing from Nicole Salazar Hall, a core commissioner for the Salt Lake City Racial Equity and Policing Commission, as well as co a commissioner for the Salt Lake City Human Rights Commission, and Dr. Lynn Camillo, who is the Assistant Dean of Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for the University of Utah School of Medicine. Thank you both for being a part of this conversation tonight. We appreciate you for spending your Friday evening evening with us. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. And don't forget, we'd love to hear from you about the show. We invite you to join our Facebook group by going to facebook.com slash group slash ABC4 in focus or send us an email in focus at abc4.com.